Shall we start? Uh, yeah. Good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Medina's working group session at IETF uh, 119. You are advancing this? Mm -hmm. So as usual, this is a not well uh, reminder, IETF policies. Uh, so please uh, uh, remember that participating in the IETF, you agree to follow IETF process and policies, uh, that if you're aware of any contribution covered by patents or patent applications, you must disclose a fact. Uh, as a participant or attendee, you acknowledge that written audio and video uh, records will be made. The information you provide will be in accordance with privacy statement, uh, will be made public. And if you have any doubts, uh, you have the list of BCPs that uh, are there to guide you through the process. Um, well, these are the usual guidelines. I guess by now you, you know that uh, you should be respectful, uh, treat others with dignity, uh, decency and respect, and please behave professionally uh, when addressing the group or people here, uh, remain technical and professional. And if you believe you have been harassed, uh, please uh, raise your concern with the ombudsperson. So uh, make sure that you log into Mutico for the meeting, please. Um, this is going to help us keep track of uh, who's uh, there, uh, remote and in-person participants. We'll keep uh, looking at the queue if you want to participate and use the handset. Uh, it's strongly recommended for raising your hand. Here are the resources. I guess uh, everybody knows now. So the agenda. Um, so we're going to start as usual with the status update. Uh, we're going to move then to the MAC address randomization draft that was uh, recently uh, in working group last call, followed by the use cases and problem statement. Uh, then we will discuss about the liaison we got from the WBA uh, and the open roaming uh, update that we had. Um, Together with that, uh, there's going to be a presentation on results from the hackathon that was running uh, over the weekend. Um, we'll go to next steps for the group. And, uh, and we have one uh, also discussion uh, that is a little off track with the mobile subscription info for the HCP. Are there any questions, uh, additions, uh, or bashing to the agenda? Okay, here none, move on. Uh, so before we start with the, with the meeting, uh, we will need uh, someone to help us take notes. Uh, this is a collaborative way so you can we can have more than one person yeah, or even if you are participating uh, someone else can take over but uh, can someone help us with notes please uh, just simple notes on the decisions so eric vink the responsibility from madinas we cannot start the meeting until we have a note taker. And the note taker, like Juan Carlos said, is very easy. There is a tool where the pencil in the, the meet echo, and you just don't take minutes of the slide. It's useless. Simply take short note of questions and answer. Thank you for any volunteer. Else we ask the last one entering the room. Can anyone help with notes, please? You will be paid a wonderful amount of zero crown for doing this, which is equal to zero euro. Okay, I'll do that. Oh. Thank you, Jen. 
Thank you very much. No guarantees for quality, though. <laughs> So, um, great. So, so let's start with the working group status update. Um, so first we have the MAC address randomization current state of affairs, uh, uh, which completed the working group uh, last call. Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, helping with the shepherding there. Um, so we'll have a presentation today on the agenda with regard to the, the latest uh, comments. Um, then uh, we have the use cases and identity requirements. Uh, the document is almost complete. Uh, there's also a presentation to, today in the agenda. The best current practices uh, handling RCM, uh, we want to leave that at the end as a next steps discussion in the agenda. Once we understand where we are, what we have been discussing and, and what we can do as a working group. And, uh, and then maybe we can, we can talk about the liaison statement that we got uh, uh, to the IETF regarding the use of uh, chargeable user identity in radius. Okay. So moving on, we have the report from the MAC address randomization draft. Okay, this is Carlos Bernardos from UC3M reporting on on the, the status of the draft. Did you change or? No. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, this is a sort of reminder of the, the goals of the document and the motivation. So I think we are all aware privacy uh, is an increasing concern or was an increasing concern by the time we started already. And we are focusing on the layer two uh, identifiers and how much uh, information that might disclose and the efforts that are being done on trying to mitigate that. There are several projects in ITF and outside ITF trying to uh, uh, use randomized MAC addresses to improve the privacy or mitigate the privacy concerns. And the goals of this document is to basically document the status of those different initiatives and keep a kind of a live repository for, for those, especially for the mobile OSs in terms of what they are doing, current practices, and how they may evolve. Next slide, please. We lost it. Doesn't work as I, okay. Okay. So this is the table of content. It's basically the same table of content of the last version. The only change that uh, we did and I will explain later is basically we switched the order of section, former section seven and eight before the section eight OS current practices was section seven. So it was before the actually the taxonomy. And uh, based on the discussion we had at the working group last call, we decided to, to switch the order because we believe it's, I mean, for, for in terms of reliability, it's better to, to have it like that. Next slide. So this is just a summary of the taxonomy. I will not go into the details is basically the same list that we had in the previous version. We have some comments by Matthew on uh, suggestion on to change one of them instead of per device to be per interface. Um, uh, me as an individual contributor to the document, and uh, I think it's implicit that everything is actually per interface. So I, I didn't change that, but of course, if the working group thinks this will be more clear to change that per device to per interface, uh, we, we can do that change, of course. But at this, that's for clarity, in the last version it still remains at this, it, it was originally. Next slide, please. There is one, I guess there is one in the queue, right, Bob? Yeah, we have Bob in the queue. I don't know if you want to take questions right now or at the end. Okay. Okay, at the end. Uh, this is the table of the OS current practices. A reminder for well, uh, for those that may not know, uh, there is a GitHub document where we try to keep this record alive. And this is kind of an experiment for this document that uh, we refer to something outside of the document where we'll be updating this after the document is, is published. Before this version, we used to have only the pointer to that repository, but as part of the comments that we received in the working group last call, 
we decided to also kind of paste the content as as of today in the document and still have the pointer. So it's like a snapshot by the time the document is published on what was there, uh, pointing to the, the GitHub for further updates that may happen after the publication of the document. Next slide, please. You can go to the next one. This is just current practices, a summary of, of those. And this is the summary of the comments that we received during the working groups like call, last call and the changes that we did. As I just mentioned, the mobile OS practices is included in the document as a snapshot, but we refer to the pointer to the live GitHub uh, content. We exchanged the order of section seven and eight. We did some additional text uh, based on the comments and we did some uh, fix, uh, fixing, uh, back fixing. Um, and we believe now the document is ready to go to the next step, basically ITF last call. So comments, Bob? Thank you. Uh, hi, Bob Hinden. So in section six, Mac randomization related activities in the ATF, the description of IPP6 is basically wrong. We, uh, the IPP6 working group changed away from using Mac addresses many years ago. It's no longer the recommend, it's no longer the default or recommendation. You don't pick that up from this text. I believe I made this comment some many meetings ago, but um, so this needs to be rewritten before this is ready to go. Sure, I fully acknowledge that. Uh, I thought it was written more like a documenting, but if I'm, I, I believe you, so we will change, yeah, for sure. And I don't remember that, that comment, but I may overlook it, but for sure we will change that. Yeah, I mean, it talks about EUI 64 in the first sentence of the section, okay, so will. it needs yeah, a yeah. lot of work. We will do it, thanks. More comments? Okay, okay thanks. Right. Thank you very much. So I guess, well, you, well, we will address the, yes. the comments and then we'll progress the, the document accordingly. Thank you very much. So next in line is uh, Jerome. Are you? Oh, cool. I'm, I'm here. Good morning, Jerome. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. So this is the second document we have in this group, uh, the use case document. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, document is also getting to a fairly stable state. Oh, oh you give me control. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, it underwent uh, six different revisions. In the last uh, meeting in July, uh, there was a comment made that maybe we had some misalignment between the uh, IPv4 and IPv6 uh, section. Uh, so we spent some time coming through the document and we found one paragraph where IPv4 was mentioned, but not IPv6, so we fixed that. Um, but, you know, to me, that was a pretty much an editorial uh, type of, of change. Um, and meanwhile, um, as you may remember, what this document was trying to do is to uh, look into what we call the use cases and the framework around this RCM problem where, you know, when we say um, my privacy is going to be compromised because they are going to see my MAC address, well, who is they and what is my privacy? Um, so we ended up defining a, a series of use cases that you see on the screen uh, for where the MAC address may be exposed to different types of actors. Um, and those actors may be human actors, you know, from your service provider, if you are in a, in a, um, a public venue or a managed uh, uh, home, for example, um, to technical devices, you know, switches, access points, and these things. So we, we try to go through every element and every exposure that is uh, possible for these. Um, this, um, um, so that, you know, helps, you know, the conversation about what exactly is the problem we're talking about and, and where are we seeing problems because, of course, the solutions are going to be very different uh, depending on where you are in an enterprise where you're given a, a work tablet where there is no uh, personal information on that tablet. Uh, the privacy exposure of, you know, RCM is completely different than if you are in a public airport, for example, with your own, your own phone. So, you know, that document has been going on for um, now two years and a half. It's getting fairly stable. Um, I, I would like to underline two things. One is that in the last section of this document, section seven, uh, we had started to explore the what we call current solutions. 
that is to say, current direction that the industry has to mitigate the RCM problem. Um, and then we concluded a, a, a few sessions ago, I think three sessions ago, um, that this was not the document for this uh, type of exploration. It would rather go into a BCP if there is a BCP uh, produced by this group, but this document should not have it. So we kept that section seven here as a reminder of you know, that direction. Um, and I think the last step before uh, going to the final version of this document will simply be to remove that section. We also had a, a section which is in 6.3 um, that we called um, requirements. And you may remember we had a long series of requirements at the beginning. Uh, and those requirements were, you know, essentially the discussions we were having in this group about what we thought um, the solution uh, requirements might be, uh, or also the work of the group uh, requirements might be. Um, so as the group work advanced, uh, that section became uh, partly obsolete. Uh, so many of these requirements were removed, uh, but three uh, are left, which are you know, uh, pertaining to RCM that you see on the screen. One is that the network must not assume that MAC address is going to be stable uh, at any time. And we know that some other groups uh, in the IEEE, for example, 8211BH and 8211BI, um, do look into this problem, into you know, a station disconnecting, reconnecting with a new MAC address, or a station changing its MAC address within a single session. Uh, but also uh, requirement number two that we understand is that if a device needs to be recognized, that uh, its identity, whatever the identity is, needs to be stable across, you know, MAC address changes. Um, and of course, you know, different use cases, different environments uh, may have different different consequences. So this is the uh, the state of this document. I'm very uh, happy to to have comments on questions. Uh, the um, uh, reflector has been fairly uh, quiet on this document for a while, which leads me to think that the document probably is reaching its its maturity. Uh, but I would love to to hear if anybody has uh, taken the time to read it and has any any comments on it today. Carlos? Yeah, Carlos Bernardo, I have one question on the requirement number three. Uh, I guess, at least in my understanding, probably that could be rewritten a bit because to me, like saying different use cases may result in different identity requirements is not a requirement per se. Probably would be something more like solutions should support potentially different uh, needs or something like that, right? So maybe some minor re re text uh, change on that requirement may be useful. Thanks. All right. That makes sense. Thank you very much. I'll propose a change. Thank you. And Juan, what's your next? Yeah. So I put myself in the queue. Um, so I think, and this is part of the, of the discussion that I guess will driving to the next steps. Uh, the document uh, has already been stable for a while regarding the, the use cases, and we've been able to derive some, some requirements. And, and, and you have listed, uh, as, as you mentioned, Jerome, some, some potential solutions that address uh, these requirements. Um, so we had the, the intention to go for the, for the BCP and, and, and just want to plant it in, in, in people's mind because we will talk about next steps. Seems like uh, uh, once we discuss the, one of the solutions that is the uh, open roaming, for instance, and the hackathon and the discussions we've been having with WBA, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, the, the BCP uh, as such uh, will be required. Probably something more like just uh, recommendations or, 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 or just practices, current practices, but not best current practices per se. And uh, if that is the case, I, I, I wonder if, if this section seven that originally was meant to go to a BCP could be kept as, a, as an annex informational or something here. Uh, but that's something that we can discuss on the, on the next steps once, once we understand a little more uh, where we are with respect to, to WBA and, and, and the discussions uh, uh, and the results from the hackathon. Thank you. That would make sense to me to be kept, you know, somewhere as, as a memory of what we discussed in this group, because I think we spent quite a lot of time in you know, looking into that section. So in an annex would make sense to me. Thank you. Thanks. So, Tianji? Uh, yes, uh, Tianji Channel Mobile. Uh, sorry, I'm a newbie to the, the group here, but uh, just uh, looking at the re uh, requirement the second, the second requirement. Uh, Oh, one case come out of my brain is uh, it's called a tethered device that is uh, like a ether type video session in the 5G system. And then you're going to have a UE with a Mac and some uh, devices connected uh, through the, the UE 
uh, which have their own unique device uh, uh, MAC addresses. So basically you have a MAC for the UE, uh, your handset itself and a bunch of Mac, unique Macs behind it, but the, all of them are connected well, uh, uh, through the Ethernet PDU session to all the outside DN. So for that things, I try to read through your uh, requirement a second. So any change of, of identity, identity may result in re-authentication. So here is like, suppose you have five tether devices to your hand side. Now the fifth one come in. Are you going to re-authentic the original one from your hand side or you just uh, accept it? So this is some case, thank you. I'm use case, sorry, yeah. Thank you, Jinji. That's a very interesting use case. You know, th this requirement is 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 not intended to be specific um, in terms of practice. It's intended to to notice that if you lose the identity of who is connecting, then necessarily you need to reestablish that connection. Um, in A2.11, for example, they they distinguish the identity of the link from the identity of the device, uh, and they envision, for example, that a device may provide a different MAC address. Uh, but, you know, maintain that this uh, new MAC address is connected to the same identity, whatever this identity is. So in, in the use case you're describing, um, I, you know, I, I don't think we should be, you know, this deciding of any, 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 any practice, but the idea is that if you lose the understanding of who is connected, of course, necessarily the service is going to be interrupted. Uh, I try to make, my, make myself more clear. It's just like nothing has been changed. You just get the fifth one one additional uh, tether device is connected. In that case, is that one going to affect your requirement second uh, on this slide? It, it doesn't look that way, right? For, I'm, I'm not expert in the field you're, you're talking about, but it seems from what you described that the device is still the same, um, but you know, there, is a, there is a new MAC address. And is, if you know, in the connection that new MAC address is tied to the same, same device, then nothing changes, does it? But you, you, you know that field better than I do. Uh, well, I, I can put on the alias. Don't want to, uh, you know. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, uh, uh, You? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, I think we just need some clarification, uh, clarification about uh, the last use case. So Tim James asking is uh, there's a Mac behind the behind the five G device. Does it mean that that Mac address? Sorry. Does it mean that like the uh, the application that using the different map is controlled by the uh, controlled by the, the application, and then the application actually asks for additional authentication because in to the end, the, yep. yeah, sorry, uh, to make the simple, consider hotspot. So basically, from your hand uh, device, iOS device, you enable your hotspot. Something can connect it through your device, the UE. And then those things will have their own unique MAC address. Well, oh, that's you are, fine. No, well, I, I got your question now. I got your question now. So in this case, is that, I think that's like Jerome said, then that is that will just apply as an IP device. Like you are actually asking for, uh, from this case, it's like your hotspot, like meaning you, you're using like a MiFi device. So in this case, uh, your MiFi actually is layer three cutoff point. So no, then the authentication is only happen to the MiFi. Uh, no, because uh, uh, in the 5G system, there is one PDU session type called the Ethernet, Ether type. So that means it's still layer two. So the device behind uh, your uh, iOS device are using Mac to connect it toward the outside network, still running layer two. But then if let's say, the, I think we can continue the discussion in the mailing list. Uh, as far as the general practice here, if you if the if the device behind the five G hotspot asking uh, doing a layer two and then require IP connectivity to the network, I would suppose in this case, uh, somehow somewhere five G. Uh, we I'm not expert on the uh, on the uh, on the five G side. So if let's say the five G side actually doing implicit authentication from the from the five G device to the to the Mac, uh, sorry, to the device behind it, then uh, we may have to. Uh, I mean, Jerome, we, we can capture that, but I, I don't know that up to, the, uh, up to my head that there is enough, a simple answer here. Uh, okay, I can put something on the alias and point it to the uh, 3GPP document. The document itself does not say about the authentication you mentioned there, just, uh, just say there's something behind it. And then the, ad the MAC address can be the iOS device you are using or the, the teaser device behind it. Thank as you. long as we are not talking about our identification here, I think that should be no, okay. But no, yeah, yes, please. 
Yeah, please, please point it to the mailing list and we will through it and try to answer it over the mailing list. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, fine. So we're moving now to the next topic, which is the liaison statement, right? So as a reminder, we got a, a liaison that was distributed on the mailing list from WBA. Um, can you please stop sharing the slides? Thanks. So, so we got the, the liaison, um, which uh, relates to the discussions we had at, I, at the previous ITF in San Francisco and the discussions we had specifically on the on the identifiers that uh, we were discussing um, after the experiment that was run um, during the the IETF uh, week and basically well there, there's a there's a long text there but uh, are you sure i'm not sure that this oh thanks or in trying to uh, I think it's not. If you say yes. Yes. Error. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I'll, I'll I'll just read the 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 the, the main part there. Um, um, there was this uh, draft Thomas open roaming, uh, where it uh, describes the the architecture and the functioning of of open roaming uh, on a more uh, technical level. And it reads, I'm going to quote, uh, WBA understands that the topic of open roaming has been raised in various ITF working groups, including Madinas, Radex, and Dispatch, as well as uh, open roaming be being used in the experiments uh, at the ITF NOC and, and ITF events. So WBA hopes the internet draft helps clarify the operation of the Open Roaming Federation and WBA and the Open Roaming Chairs would be happy to discuss the operation of the Federation in more details. Uh, WBA would welcome the opportunity to work with ITF NOC at future ITF events and would be happy to organize the ability of ITF attendees to sign up for an Open Roaming Test credential at such events, enabling ITF attendees to provision Open Roaming credentials. So, um, Yeah, we're having sharing. issues sharing the screen. Yeah, from the iPad, if you can share, because I, I, I had the link, but I couldn't. It's just a setup here that is not letting us share. Um, so, yeah, uh, then th there's one paragraph that says that it's come to our attention that because of discussions at ITF 117, the Madinas meeting, an, is an issue was raised regarding the handling of uh, CUID or chargeable user ID radius attribute 89 in the radius exchange. The discussions at Madinas highlighted an issue regarding the possibility for privacy leakage across the interfaces between an IDP uh, and an ANP, so identity provider and access network provider. The WBA uh, roaming working group takes the management of end user privacy very seriously. However, there are several use cases where the ability to identify unique user interactions are critical to managing roaming or other use cases. As a result, the RWG will be reviewing our requirements, best practices in detail with intention of clarifying the correct usage and handling of this attribute. We welcome input and discussions with Madinas in this review to ensure that end user privacy is protected while ensuring that business operations can continue. After the WBA RWG has completed our analysis, we will welcome a joint meeting to review the discuss recommendations in the first quarter of 2024. For more information, please contact uh, the WBA PMO. So uh, I guess in short, uh, what they're saying is uh, they, they got the feedback from, from the experiments that we were uh, discussing. Um, and they are looking at uh, some of the the issues that were raised. And as part of that, there was 
uh, also some some work being done at the hackathon here uh, at the last weekend. So maybe we can, I guess, in the interest of time, move to the to the next topic, right? And and show that presentation. Sure. Hi, Mark. Hey, Juan Carlos, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, Mark. Yeah, so I guess following on from that liaison, wanting to report on last weekend's activities uh, at the hackathon where we had a particular project defined to to look at um, open roaming um, so the background here uh, i think we've touched on all of these points already but um, uh, draft thomas open roaming um, describes the operation of the open roaming federation um, and Jerome has, has talk, uh, taken us through the, the Medina's use cases, um, and open roaming is listed in the existing solutions section uh, of the use case internet draft. Uh, and just a snippet here out of that text. So it says, offering the possibility of the user or the device to keep their identity obfuscated from the local network operator. And then, um, as we're aware, um, back at ITF 117, uh, Warren presented some experiences uh, with open roaming um, with a limited uh, number of authentication exchanges um, indicating privacy leakage or possible privacy leakage across the radius interface between the open roaming identity provider and the open roaming access provider. So that's some scene setting as it were. Um, in terms of the objectives of, of uh, the, the hackathon project, um, it was to go into a little bit more detail um, and analysis in terms of the, the possible leakage of privacy by now a, a variety of open roaming IDPs um, with different open roaming ANP use cases. Uh, and I guess this is a reflection that, that the um, original presentation was was to one or two IDPs, and we're recognizing that this is linked to IDP configuration. And so the uh, idea here is to, to look at this as broad as possible from an IDP perspective, a credential holder perspective, to see how they've configured their systems. Um, and so with that in mind, the aim is to capture now um, authentication exchanges between different access network implementations and a wide range of production uh, open roaming identity providers. Given that open, open roaming is a production system, uh, we need to um, observe logs with real world um, credentials being authenticated to IDPs on access networks. So that's the that was the objectives. Um, in terms of um, the actual uh, uh, process, um, we set up four separate um, open roaming access networks. Um, and you can see those described here. So they were, they uh, included um, Cisco Catalyst um, going to uh, the radius functionality in Cisco Hotspot Connector. Then we had um, Radiator access point going to the Radiator proxy. Uh, we had Cisco Meraki going to a cloud instance of RADSEC proxy, and then we had uh, MicroTIC, which uh, is a, a sort of a, a standalone sort of AP and RADSEC proxy all in one. And those all systems were used to, uh, uh, to take logs of particular authentication exchanges with a, a variety of different identity providers. Um, so, which IDP realms were observed. Uh, and so some of these were um, uh, used in the, in the setup from the participants of the open roaming project at Hackathon, but uh, equally some of these were observed by um, other Hackathon participants who happened to have open roaming credentials configured on their devices. And obviously those open roaming devices that see an open roaming network will automatically trigger an authentication to that network. Um, and so we have a mix here of, of 
I guess, hackathon driven uh, uh, exchanges and also um, exchanges with, with other devices which weren't managed um, by, by the hackathon project. Um, the first two, um, Apple Open Roaming Net and, and Google Open Roaming Net, were the ones I think Warren um, uh, observed back in ITF 117. Um, and then you can see the other uh, 13 are new IBPs. Um, so from a realm perspective, you see the 3GBP realm um, identifying um, with SIM credentials. And so you can see the mobile country code 310 as being the USA, the mobile network code, we've got uh, 280, 150, and 410 as different uh, public LAN mobile network uh, identifiers. Um, and then we see a, a, a selection of other realms that we uh, observed uh, from obviously um, different providers of credentials who have joined the Open Realm Federation. So that was the, the IDPs. And now let's look at some, some observations. Um, so when we're looking at the observations just around username, so this is username in access request, um, we observe that all the PLMN IDs, so the three different MNCs, all operate using EAP AKA, uh, and they have configured pseudonyms. Uh, so that is identified uh, uh, by having the, the NAI identified with the leading character two, which is the EAP AKA definition of a pseudonym. And there we see a, an example of a pseudonym. Um, all other EAP uh, methods uh, use anonymous at realm. So across all of those uh, devices, uh, they all present anonymous at realm as the EAP outer identity. Um, we do, we did observe username rewrite. So uh, the access accept username can be rewritten uh, and we see the realms EU, Google Open Roaming Net, Apple Open Roaming Net and CLUS Open Roaming Net all uh, overwriting username in access accept. Um, and so there we see an example where we've got anonymous at apple.openroom.net in the access request, and that gets overwritten uh, in the access accept with uh, the text you see below. So that's from a username perspective. Um, made some observation around class attribute number 25. Um, Odysseus.net um, is the only non-PLMN uh, realm that doesn't return a CUI. Um, and in fact, it uses class attribute uh, that it's obviously using to correlate with accounting. Um, and there you can see the, the, the class that we observed, which um, obviously is some binary data um, that has, you know, um, I guess, uh, unknown uh, attributes encoded. Um, interesting that all three um, public LAN mobile network operators return three instances of class attribute. Uh, and so let's look at what they look like. So the first one um, uh, is static for all three PLMN IDs and could well be used for you know, roaming gateway. We've got this RGW uh, in the class attribute. We've got another class attribute which varies on a user by user basis. And we've got this BIC and this long string. Um, and then we've got the third class attribute which looks to embed some sort of diameter routing uh, as well as the actual user IMSI um, within the class attribute. So 310, 410 for this particular IMSI you can see and then the MSIN. Um, uh, as well as the uh, the realm for this particular network. So those are some observations around class. Um, obviously, this started with chargeable user uh, identity. And so let's look at some observations around chargeable user identi identifier. Uh, I guess first, compared with perhaps Warren's uh, uh, setup, the uncontrolled hackathon environment, it wasn't really conducive for, for logging mobility events as we were switching between open access networks. Uh, we do note that 
uh, one of the IDPs, so EU, Google, Open Room and Net has user explicit opt-in uh, with, the, with the IDP to share email identity. Uh, in that case, the email is actually, uh, the email address is actually uh, returned in CUI. Um, the clus.openroaming.net returns a fixed value um, uh, of test user at cls.openroaming.net. Uh, and WBA 3AF521 net and secure Wi-Fi.io realms did not return any CUI or class attribute. Um, finally, let's look at the examples of encoded CUI. Um, so from a mobile PLMN ID perspective, we see CUI being, um, it looks sort of a, a random, um, uh, set of, of characters. Uh, in, in the apple.openroaming.net example, we see it looks like um, some sort of account information is being uh, appended in the CUI. Um, for the Google, uh, openroaming.goo uh, example, so this is with a Pixel phone, uh, and you can see the, the CUI example captured there. And then for, we were fortunate enough to, to get a Tokyo uh, uh, attribute um, from the deployment in Tokyo City Metro. And you can see the example of the CUI captured um, for that identity provider. So some takeaways. Um, I, yeah, we confirmed attributes in Access Accept can be used to leak uh, privacy. Um, I guess we, we see that since the uh, the IETF 117, the the Radex deprecating radius uh, has added a section on minimizing personal identifiable information, um, and so that has a recommended uh, construction for CUI as hash of visited network data, user identifier, and key, um, and so we can I guess identify. Uh, um, username rewrite and class that are unlikely to correspond to a hashed user identifier. So unlikely that we have uh, this username rewrite, it's unlikely that this is this is hashed, although we, we, we can't be certain. And it's pretty certain that this class with an IMSI um, isn't a hashed user identifier. Um, uh, moving on, um, in terms of CUI and class, uh, so, so the observed CUIs and cl uh, class, uh, some examples could well correspond to hashed user identifiers. So when we look at these, this class, um, this class starting with BIC, or these other CUI examples, these could all represent hashed user identifiers, I guess. Uh, we don't um, know whether the access network was included in that hash because uh, as I said, we, it was difficult to test mobility events. Um, from the hackathon environment. Um, so some key actions or considerations um, from the Radex internet draft, obviously that's focused on privacy leakage using chargeable user identifier. Um, the question is, is whether there should be sections on username rewrite and use of class uh, and recommendations there as well. Um, I guess, uh, considerations for wireless broadband alliance and open roaming, uh, should they specify use of hashed identifiers in access accept, unless the user has explicitly agreed to terms that permit sharing of permanent identifiers, and obviously something to take up with wireless broadband alliance. Um, and my final slide, yeah, thanks to all the hackathon participants. Um, obviously, it was a full weekend of looking at logs, capturing those, and obviously, distilling this to Medina's presentation. So, happy to take comments, questions, and feedback. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so, we have Joe. Howdy. Joe Clark uh, speaking on behalf of the NOC. Um, so one of the things that we tested last time, and um, go back one slide if you wouldn't mind, please. Um, you, you hit it um, with the 
hash and unless the user has explicitly agreed, I know you get it there, mm -hmm. unless the user has explicitly agreed to the terms of um, service. Yeah. What we saw was in the authenticator we were using, that was the default option. And there was really no explicit agreement. There was the only pop-up we got was when we chose to turn that off. And then it said, if you don't share this information, you likely, you may not get the full service that you want. Um, as opposed to truly being opted in to say, I know that I will share my permanent um, information or, or my my a permanent identifier with, with the parties involved. So that, that was one of the concerns because to your point, when we didn't check that option, we saw the, you know, UID, UUID type um, uh, uh, CUI. Um, the other thing I, I would say is, uh, Juan Carlos, I think you, you started this off by saying uh, as part of the liaison statement, there was willingness to work with the NOC in the future. Um, I'll put it in the chat, but uh, we have an email alias. We're not exactly like a typical working group, but if, if there are requests, um, people can email and we can, we can discuss that, um, but uh, that, that would be interesting. I would just say that I think having more user awareness that, hey, your privacy could be being shared here would be a good thing. Uh, and that's maybe not fully there for all use cases of open roaming. Yeah, yeah, Joe, I guess just an observation. I mean, I mean, we saw that CUI in one out of 15 IDPs. Um, I guess just just uh, highlight that, um, and the others, um, they look to be not UUIDs being shared, although um, obviously without us testing mobility, it's hard to see whether they were actually hashing the access network as well. Um, but uh, obviously th those are, items to follow up with and to understand whether access network is being hashed and, and whether the uh, user's UUID is being hashed in those responses. Thanks. <clears throat> so I put myself in the queue and uh, well, ju just to, to bounce on, 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 on the comment, actually, I, I had that follow up similar to what uh, Joe said. Uh, I think uh, from the from the discoveries, um, which are actually very, very, very interesting. I see at least three different levels of uh, actions that we can take. Uh, one of them is uh, clearly on, on, the, on the radius uh, recommendations, and I will let, uh, I guess, uh, Alan will, will get more in detail about that. Uh, there's another one on uh, the, the commonality or how this is going to be used by WPA or whether there's going to be some um, homogeneous type of uh, deployments that uh, we can guarantee that beyond Radix uh, specifying how to use it, that WBA will actually uh, say this is the way WBA is doing it, or if you sign to WBA, you you are guaranteed that this is uh, this is the way we are treating your privacy. And and finally, just to to reemphasize uh, Joe's point, I think there is also the the agreement to share your your personal data that right now we also experience it's not common uh, with the different uh, profiles and implementations. And I think that that is not necessarily covered by, by the radius uh, discussions that we are, we're, we're having or, or, or the, the points here. And maybe that's another, another important point and action that, that we should carry on and, and make sure that it's not lost because it's, uh, it was valuable. But I'll, I'll stop there and let Alan get into the radius, I guess. Yeah, hi, this is Alan. Yes, um, any kind of user agreement is political error. Radius won't touch that. Very true. Um, I'll give a bit of background as to the interaction between username and COI in class, just so um, I think everyone's clear on what's going on. The original idea was username was your public identifier. Sometimes it was not quite what you wanted, so you could return a username in an access accept, and that was supposed to be sent back in accounting packets. So that was some username rewriting there. Then there was the realization that, especially with EAP and with anonymous outer identifiers, you wanted a user identifier, which was public but not tied to the particular user. You couldn't use username because that was already used for 
proxying, so that CUI was added. Um, and separately, class is really an opaque token that the um, IDP hands back to the visit network and it's supposed to be echoed back. Um, and it's explicitly useless to everyone other than the IDP to the home network. Um, so the WBA is, is, is free to define whatever behavior they want, uh, but that's sort of the scope as to what those three different attributes do. So things like class and in these examples, if they have any structure, that's magical and you cannot assume anything from it. Um, you might be able to look at it and go, I think that's what it means, but it's only supposed to have meaning for the visit, in that, sorry, for the IDP, the home network. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification, Alan. Bob? Yeah, I am. I wanted to respond to uh, Joe's observations. I I think um, early on in the uh, in the kind of open roaming journey with the WBA, I think it was a thought that there were certain roaming models that would require some exchange of identity, and and well, from what we've seen here, that has kind of largely been you know disproven. So I think what Joe may be seeing are some, you know, artifacts of that, you know, kind of earlier um, kind of a premise. So, but I think it probably makes sense to make that, you know, clearer that kind of the um, uh, not sharing any identity should be the, the default. The default. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. So, so this is this is interesting, and and, and uh, let me uh, ask this question openly. Uh, Madinas is chartered to uh, look at uh, the effects of uh, market randomization uh, on network services. Uh, it's been identified right now that uh, uh, there are some use cases that we care about, and there are some solutions that address those use cases and. Um, we are also chartered as working group to liaise with uh, other working groups here in the IETF as well as outside the IETF, like it is the case with WBA. Uh, and this is why we're having this uh, open discussion uh, right now with WBA. So to me, I mean, working on other SEOs and having received a, a liaison, normally I would think <laughs> that... Uh, the findings and the discussions that we're having here should be documented and and, and uh, sent back to WBA. Uh, and again, normally I would say uh, in a liaison statement, but, but uh, nor, that's not the usual way we work in IETF. We're very informal, the way we communicate. And as you see, there's already things happening in Radix without necessarily making uh, formal discussions. So... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking an open question right now because I see that there are important findings that should be documented so that they are not lost, that there's follow-up. And the follow-up could probably take place in Radex, could probably take place in the WBA. Uh, both groups are, are open right now uh, to hearing these recommendations either in, in the draft uh, that has uh, been uh, discussed in, in Radex uh, or the, the roaming working group in WBA. So um, I wonder, uh, let me first ask the question to the working group is, would there be a preferred way to, to move along? Again, I, I think that it's worth documenting this discussion and making sure that we don't lose any of these points, any of these findings, so that the systems evolve in a good way that uh, privacy is uh, preserved and that the internet access is uh, done in a proper way for the, for the users. Um, Eric? Yeah, so speaking as a responsibility for, for Madinas here, you're right. I mean, if we are doing some findings, we are all engineers looking for the good of the, of the internet or for the Wi-Fi roaming or whatever, so we should keep this somewhere. Uh, I just have a quick look on the Madinas charter. 
we cannot do it here. I mean, we can still put a draft, right? We can maybe even add up, but we cannot publish a draft uh, specifically on the finding. I don't know about RADEX, though, because RADEX has been extended to care about not open roaming, but multiple roaming. So I would assume, I'm looking at you, uh, I would love to get your feedback because I have not a little clue. I, I know I reviewed the RADEX chapter years ago, months ago, but yes. Um, there is explicitly an item in the current RADEX charter on best practices for roaming. And this could fall into that. And I think that's the best way to move forward on this. So, so l let me let me ask uh, Eric before before you, you leave the mic, uh, because there were a f I, I'm I'm trying to 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 make it as as simple as possible. It is not. I think we're finding a lot of things, but there is extensions, potential extensions to to radius or recommendations on how to use uh, radius. There is uh, recommendations on on how to share or exchanging private information. And this is more on the implementation of the WBA profiles. And then there is recommendations on uh, homogeneous deployment of and, open and roaming. So, so it's so outside of Madinas and it smells very much open uh, around Redex. Yes, this is Alan again. So some of this can be in, in Radex, how to use all this properly to give privacy. But once you get down into how MAC addresses behave on the network, that's completely outside the scope of RADEX. Um, you know, how often your MAC address should change. It affects RADEX, but we can't say anything about mm -hmm. it because it's, it's not part of the radius and, protocol. And, and the itself. default of the email, for instance, the, the, what Joe was mentioning too, like uh, having the, the default uh, opt-in, opt-out type of thing. I think that's also... That's probably outside the scope of RADEX. Some other things may be in scope, like if your identifier changes in the middle of a session or your MAC address changes in the middle of a session, I would expect that to be a completely different session. Mm -hmm. um, and that gets into issues of network access, which interacts with RADEX. So I, I think probably half or more of this could be done in RADEX as open roaming, best practices, privacy, Here's how it affects this. Here's how to do it. Um, some of it could be in WBA as to how WBA wants their members to behave. And then the rest of it, I, I would say any sort of MAC address, local network thing would probably be IEEE, but I, I don't know anything about that. And to come back to your comment, Juan Carlos, about the, the use of not opt-in for the email address. I think this is purely business. I mean, then speaking not as an AD because I don't know enough on, on this one. Uh, so speaking as an individual contributor, it's typically a business relationship. We may want to say somewhere, maybe I'm looking again at the Radex, right? I'm trying to push you the hot potato. Um, that is chargeable user ID in operational consideration, on privacy consideration. We may put a few words there, but it will be one paragraph or two, basically. Okay. Looks like we agree. Okay. So basically, the good work done in the hackathon, and thank you for doing it, and all the discovery done by the NOC, et cetera, and so on. Um, I think this group will still be interested to follow, mm -hmm. but the actual work document will be moved into Radex. Yeah, no, that, that, I, that I agree. And, and, and again, here I just want to make sure that we document the findings so that the, it's not lost and, and it's, the work is done, whatever it needs to be done. But but because we, we have the in the in our charter we have liaison and we have best current practices, not not the actual solution, right? Yeah. Just these are two vehicles that we can use to communicate um, our findings. Yeah, this is Alan again. Um, Mark uh, was alluding to this earlier. Um, there is a document in Radex. It started off as deprecating UDP and TCP outside of secure networks. And it quickly became, here's a list of insecure things to do anything or what's happening anywhere in radius. And then one of the outcomes um, was some recommendations for how to create and use the CUI. 
um, and that's been reviewed by the WBA and shared with the WBA. And if they have any feedback, um, I've talked to them. And the, the explicit goal is to make sure that whatever text goes into that document meets everyone's needs. And that will happen before it gets published. OK. Thank you very much, Arlan, for that. I have one more comment, but sorry, I was missing the, the queue. I, we have Carrie on the queue. Yeah, hi, Carrie Houghton from Radiator Software, and I was uh, participating there in the Open Roaming Hackathon as well, and I'm uh, supporting uh, Alan's points of this that. Yeah, this should be done on multiple levels. The MAC address randomization definitely belongs to this group, but this kind of uh, uh, things that are concerning, let's say, chargeable user identity and all that radio stuff, that should go into raw text because we are working also on several different other privacy-related things there. And also there is this best practices work done in raw text as well. So I think it should be that should be a kind of better working group to continue that work there. But that, this was just to support, for example, Alana and other comments that said the same here. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, one last point, I put myself again in the queue, just to make sure that, again, we don't lose uh, all this valuable information. So Mark, uh, in your presentation, you, 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 you highlighted the fact that there were some inconclusive tests with regards to roaming between different access networks. So um, I guess there's potential to, to do a little more work there, right? Uh, since we, we, we show this uh, uh, different setups of, of uh, multiple networks being together and some sort of an interrupt, um, there could be a little more tests to find out, uh, for instance, if the, the IDP provides a the same CUI to different access network providers. And, and then there could be a correlation between these two, like Warren was explaining last time. So my, I don't know, my impression is that there, there's potential to do a little more research on there. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, have any feedback, uh, the implementers out there. Yeah, uh, Carlos, in the queue. Yes, I, I agree with that. I mean, we we couldn't test that in in the hackathon, but I I think that's something that we definitely should try. And the point is whether we attempt to do that in another hackathon type of thing, or we try to do it uh, offline from now until Brisbane. That's something that we can discuss offline with Mark. Yeah, on the list, of course. Mark. Yeah, um, I guess, as we pointed out, maybe the hackathon isn't the best environment to do these sort of um, types of tests, given given the number of devices in the room and, and the, the uh, I guess, those that we saw were provisioned with open Roman credentials that we didn't control, but we're obviously creating authentication traffic uh, onto our network. So I think maybe it would be better to be more in a more controlled environment. Um, but maybe a, a different route, maybe this is something to take up with WBA, is, is whether they can survey their, their credential holders um, and whether those credential holders are, are able to share um, how they um, create the, the particular attributes in the return. So rather than us just observing, we can sort of tie that up with um, you know feedback from credential holders and, and perhaps that's the best way because if we are going to you know make recommendations as to perhaps them changing their algorithms about how they create particular attribute values um, then it starts that conversation with them um, around best practice mm -hmm. right yeah, precisely. I think we, we need to eventually con conclude in this best practices, and that is a key point. So thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, so we have uh, Jan Friedrich. Yeah, Jan Friedrich here from uh, DFN. Um, one thing that I would raise also is that it's not just the user that should um, agree to, to terms of sharing uh, the identifiers. I think one 
mic is getting away. Um, one, one thing that we also should consider is that maybe some um, access network providers don't care at all about the um, identifier. They just want to have one string that they can throw at law enforcement if they ever ask. And some others may have a more pressing need to actually identify the user. So should be possible for a ANP to signal to the IDP, okay, this is the level of assurance I want to have. And if you are able to give me that, then please give me that. Or if you don't, then okay, I'll accept whatever you have. But I don't want to store more specific options than that if ever possible. If I'm making any sense. When you say I, meaning the access network. Yeah, I as at access network don't want to store any information that is bound to any personal uh, or any personal data. So if you can give me just an opaque token, then please throw that at me and don't use any username specific ID that I can resolve because I don't want that. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you very much, Mark. So I guess this is uh, perfect timing for moving to the next steps. <laughs> right, so uh, I guess, uh, as you see, we've been having a lot of uh, very fruitful discussions and uh, findings. Uh, there's some potential follow-up uh, with Radex, uh, WBA, uh, some tests offline. Um, I'm, I would not like to, to rush to a decision on, on what exactly we do next, uh, but probably some, something that we would like to discuss on the mailing list, uh, digest everyone, what we've been hearing, you know, the findings that, that we're getting on the, on the practices that uh, we believe should be followed uh, if this technology is already being deployed. Uh, as we saw and, and, and Mark mentioned in the and the hackathon, uh, even though it was a setup on one table, multiple uh, uh, clients were connecting to this setup because uh, this is a technology that is being rolled out uh, already uh, by several uh, service providers, uh, cellular or manufacturers of, of uh, devices. So I think it's important that we as IETF make sure that uh, internet connectivity is done in a proper way. So let's keep this in mind and, and I don't know, uh, at least uh, I would encourage discussion on the mailing list to see exactly how we can do, we, I mean, Madinas can, can help in this case, uh, providing this uh, recommendations to the, to the proper audience. Uh, I don't know if there's any open discussion on this topic. Bob? Hi, um, Bob Hinden. Sorry to be the um, bearer of bad news, but I'm not sure there is any more work to be done here. I think the two documents you have queued up meet the, what was in the charter. <clears throat> the previous talk, in my opinion, has nothing to do with this working group. You have no way of, you can't publish a document because it's not in scope for your charter. So I think, is there anything relevant to do regarding random MAC addresses in IEEE? I haven't heard anything, so. You, you may in fact be done. Eric, thank you. And of course, it's mostly the working group decision whether he wants to recharter. Uh, it's not only my decision as an AD, uh, but currently I'm pretty much in the same shoes as, as Bob. Uh, the group has been working for two, three years now. Well, I don't know exactly. We have produced two drafts that are in good shape. So as far as I remember correctly, one is working group last call already. The other one should be done anytime soon. Let's publish it because mm -hmm. we need to, to achieve our milestone, mostly on the time, right? So in two, three years, that's fast for the ATF. They are useful. Uh, all the rest has been moving somehow to Radex and sorry, Alan. <laughs> but I mean, that's how the ATF works, right? Uh, it's typically because you are here, we can do and grow stuff. So that's perfectly fine. It works like design somehow. Now, do we want to take other stuff in Madinas? I'm completely open to it, but we need to get proposal and we will need to go over rechartering. 
I think there is a BCP document, mm -hmm. which is there. Uh, it start, it stop, it start, it stop. Uh, honestly, I think the working group will need to think if there is nobody happy or ready to work on the BCP document, uh, let's declare it dead. It's not the first time, nothing is shameful, right? Situation has changed for three years and close the working group. I mean, closing a working group that's as an AD, this is so satisfying, right? <laughs> you cannot imagine. And I think for the, the complete working group as well, right? Because you have done our job, right? Mission accomplished. Uh, and I mean it, right? So anyway, it's, it's not up to me, right? So it's up to the working group to decide. Thank you very much yeah, for both uh, Bob and, and, and Eric. And, and it's truly now uh, putting ourselves in the shoes of a working group that has uh, milestones and, 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 um, and a charter. 100% uh, agree. So, so we started the group with, with something in mind. And, and right now we're having a, a discussion that is starting to get a little off track. And, and Well, a little off track, but I, I don't want to say it in a negative way. We are getting a lot of uh, good uh, findings uh, from this discussion. And I think there's positive outcomes. Uh, and again, I, do, I just want to make sure that those outcomes are not lost. So whatever we find, I want to make sure that it's taken either to Radex or to WBA or to some BCP that right now it's non-existent or, or doesn't look like the ones we have on, on, on the book, but at least that, uh, that those findings are, are, are not lost. Um, and of course, if we believe there's more work to do, 100% agree. I mean, right now we have the options either uh, work on a BCP, uh, close a group or recharter pretty much. And just for information, just look about the history. This group has been officially created in September 2021. Just a little bit more than two years. So, well done. Thank you. Uh, we have, you mean at this session? So we have a yeah, time permitting presentation that uh, was received at the last minute. Uh, it's not in my updated uh, from Liu, uh, yep. you and uh, but yes. There, so the, uh, the next presentation just give me um, to allow, allow me sometimes to introduce it because I was the one pushing this presentation to this working group. So we were in a DHC working group yesterday and somebody proposed something about roaming uh, between cellular and Wi-Fi and he wanted to use DHC and I think it's maybe not the right point to it. And as I know, in this working group, there are some, again, you will not like it, but it's not linked really to Madinas, but there are some roaming experience and actually Wi-Fi experience as well. This may be the right things to do just to help those people. So if you want to listen to it, if the speaker are there for five, 10 minutes and help them. If you don't mind, thank you in advance for them. Thanks, Eric. So you please join us uh, i think i move myself can you guys hear me now yes okay uh do you uh, i mean do you guys have this have the deck or i need to put it uh, from my side put it on from my side you have to do it yes because we okay uh it. just give me one second And actually, I post the uh, the question and also the link to the uh, for the job uh, in the mailing list, just yeah, in case you guys uh, hasn't checked it. Uh, how do I? Okay, let me see. Do I have to control? Just want to make sure. You need to request. You need to request uh, sharing. Oh, okay. We'll grant you. Uh, yeah, let me see. I'm new to this, so that's why I'm trying to uh, the way I can hit the uh, request. Ask for share slide. Okay.
they let your spouse. I only see the one that, uh, can I share it from my screen? Because uh, I only see yeah, those available in your website. Yeah, you can share from your screen. You should be able to do it. Okay. Available document. Maybe I just talk through it. I mean, yeah, because I don't think uh, I want to waste the time. Yeah, I, I don't want to waste your time here. So basically, I think uh, we present a draft uh, about the, uh, the mobile subscription. So just uh, try to describe you the scenario here. The scenario is uh, you have a mobile a mobile phone and then you roam it from uh, from the outside 5G network and then go back home. Then uh, you attach to the home uh, home device. Uh, usually, this happens when you. Uh, and, and when you get when you when you roam back to the home network, usually uh, the device setup uh, will prefer to use WPA uh, PSK. And uh, in some con in some situation, uh, you may want to continue. I mean, the operator uh, which uh, who owns the both the uh, mobile network and also the the home network, they want to provide the uh, service connectivity. Uh, in the case that if they support uh, WPA enterprise, meaning that your home gateway. Uh, enable WPA Enterprise or your uh, a work network using WPA Enterprise. That's no problem because you can just use the standard uh, zip, uh, the uh, e AKA to authenticate, and then uh, the the operator will know that oh, okay, this is a device belongs to this person, and then this is a service that uh, they they sign up. It will just work. But then uh, at home, I think uh, at least most of the uh, in in our in our in our environment, most of home that today they just set up for PSK as a preferred. Uh, it's a it, it's the primary choice. It's just because they have other devices they may not support uh, 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 the uh, WP Enterprise. So when the uh, when the device uh, go back to the home, they will connect to the they will prefer to connect to the PSK, and uh, then they will lose connectivity. Uh, sorry, then they will lose the uh, identity to the operator uh, because in the new uh, LCA world, and we won't be able to provide uh, the same service to the user or because we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't identify the device. So we're proposing to uh, a, a requirement in this case, we're proposing, uh, sorry, first we define the requirement and the second that we're looking at the solution. Uh, the solution that we originally proposed saying we will uh, ask to use DXCP and RA to have an exchange of the request and then the network, if let's say the device wants to net the network knows that this is my identity and it's always driven by the device and then the network will signal to the device saying, okay, we can support uh, the out band, uh, the uh, uh, the AKA over HTTPS, then the network just simply give the URI to the device. If the device want to exchange the information, then it will trigger the, the AKA authentication over HTTPS. So this is just a kind of like extension for the zip AKA, uh, the SIM AKA and uh, in the PSK network so that then the network will be able to identify the device to provide the, the service continuity. Uh, and I think just like Eric said that we, when we presented it to the uh, DXCP working group, uh, they said that there may be other ways to do it. And uh, he, has, he recommended us to bring the requirement uh, to the uh, to the Medinas, uh, uh working group because you guys, I mean, we we actually here is looking at uh, the MAC address change because in the past, we don't really need that uh, implicit exchange because we, we just using implicit uh, connection using the MAC address to do it. But then in new world that we won't be able to do it because for, uh, for the good privacy reason. So this is uh, basically the, uh, the background of the draft. And, uh, and also in the, in the, in the, in the, w, uh, in the uh, DHC working group, they also uh, mentioned something about the open, uh, or the open roaming. Maybe there's some, like, some way that in the beacon that we can start exchanging information. And I'm not really familiar with open roaming. So that's why uh, I would just need help uh, from the working group to guide us what is the best way. I mean, the first question that I think I would like to discuss here is, uh, is, it a require, is, is it a valid requirement for uh, other operators? Uh, you, you own both the mobile network and also the private network. And then when you get home, then they will prefer to use the, w, I mean, the device, prefer to use WPA PSK, then uh, you will not be able to provide service continuity. Maybe that is the first question that uh, we would like to discuss in the working group. Thank you very much. So we have people in the queue. Uh, Eric? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if it helps, you can, you can always use. 
Bob. Um, hi, Bob Hinden. So I may just not understand what's being proposed, but from what you said, um, I mean, my phone is right now connected to the cellular network and to the private network, the Wi-Fi here. Works just fine. I can go back and forth. I walk outside, it works. I come back in, it works. It's seamless. I'm not sure what problem this is solving. I certainly don't want the operator to necessarily know that I'm now on this network. It's not none of their business. Um, it means all kinds of privacy concerns. So I, I'm not sure why this is a problem that needs to be solved when it seems to work just fine today. Uh, uh, Lorenzo Colidi, what do you mean by service continuity? What service, what is remaining continuous? between the mobile and the Wi-Fi network? So in some cases, like uh, when we say, uh, when we identify a device that we are providing certain of QoS or certain uh, speed limit for device. And, uh, and, and because it's bounced by the contract when they sign with uh, the, the, uh, the mobile contract, for example. So we want to guarantee the same experience and same service QoS for the user when go to the home network. So this is some of the uh, service continuity we want to provide to the user, and this is one of the use cases. Okay. Okay. So I, I think the words service continuity are very confusing in that case. When when if you say service continuity, you you would sort of assume that I mean what I thought was that you were sort of going to be providing, for example, the same IPv6 prefix and so on. What you're trying to do instead is you're trying to figure out if the if the if the device connected to your to your network is also a customer of your other network which to me was very confusing. I would have to sort of rewind your entire presentation and play it back to understand what you're doing at this point. Um, so yeah, uh, that would be, I think if you present this again, maybe it would be useful to, to clarify that. To, yeah, to uh, sure. That. I mean, one of the, yeah, another use case we, uh, we, we, we can, I mean, sorry, we can foresee here is uh, in case you, uh, for, for like for, uh, for the user who signed up for parental control for a particular device, uh, sorry, for a particular uh, service or in the contract that we label that like, this is how we protect the uh, children, for example. And, and, then, and then we will have obligation to make sure that when the device wrong, it's not like serving a different client, uh, sorry, a customer from a different, from a different network. It's just like that we, when, we want to make sure that when uh, the kids say connect to the home, uh, home network, then, uh, which is also uh, in under the same umbrella of the of the contract, just we want to make sure that we can provide the same type of protection uh, to the user uh, to the to the kids, so that then we know that okay, yeah, his parents designed to use uh, this protection for the kid, and then he signed for this service, we will be able to do it. Okay, so then you're doing sort of EAPs, essentially EAPs or EPACA, EPACA authentication to figure out who the user is. You're doing that to the uh, we, we can definitely do that from when they roam from the 5G network. The challenge one we have is because the home when they connect to the home, uh, so when, the, when they bring, let's say the kid bring the device back home, uh, usually they would use the home Wi-Fi first to connect to the home Wi-Fi. And when they connect to the home Wi-Fi, they will use this, uh, the SIM PSK. Uh, sorry, uh, not SIM, sorry. Uh, they will use the WPA PSK first. Uh, so then we will, in this case, because on the, in, in, in the new like web, uh, the, the one of my MAC address, we won't be able to identify the device anymore. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Baba, I can't answer your question for, so, sorry about that, uh, that person uh, mentioned about, okay, you have uh, uh, your phone and then you are outside with a 5G and come back and then with Wi-Fi. Uh, actually, there's uh, some uh, kids already defined in 3GPP about how it's going to work because uh, for the 5G, you are going to have your uh, 3GPP access. Well, when you come back to the room, you can use uh, Wi-Fi to access. But the thing is, there are another kind of non-3GPPW wireless interface. Means you're still going to go through some non-3GPP access, but on the core network is going to 3GPP or the 5G core network. In that case, I can see the value about uh, URI, right? URI's uh, proposal there. Because in this case, you are sharing on two uh, channels. You are sharing the same core network, although the access part is different. One in the 3GPP, one in the non-3GPP. 
yeah, that is the, the, the value I think the proposal is going to add. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Clidi, I think you could, uh, you could use IWL LAN to authenticate yourself to the network and get some token there that you can replay on the, on the Wi-Fi, right? Because, uh, or, or you could literally use your LTE connection, which is still up when you connect to the access point to sort of do some authentication with the through GPP network and then, uh, you know, get some, some token there. Uh, because like, if you're trying to figure out, is this, is this customer, my customer on the cell network, then you know that you can get some proof from the cell network that that they are your customer, and then you can replay that proof to your uh, home gateway. Right. All right, Mark. Yeah, um, if you're you know tunneling back to your three GPP core, then ultimately this is three GPP's problem to solve. <laughs> Right, so um, I uh, and and actually they already have a solution. So there's already a non three GPP access specification. Thank you. You? Yeah. So I think I just want to echo what. Uh, when they're saying if there's a way that, I mean, the whole point here is we are not targeted. I mean, sorry, we are not defining any solution here. We are more like uh, asking for the, for the team to say there's a best way to do it because from what we're understanding, uh, yes, uh, all we want is see there's a way that, that we can communicate to the device saying that you are on the same network, but uh, on a different access. And uh, the, the, the traditional way that we know about it is using uh, SIP AKA to try to do the authentication. But then this is not happening now today in the home network. If somebody like can point us to the right uh, document or right solution in the mailing list, we, we appreciate that. Uh, but then in the end is we just want to signal uh, to, to signal to the device and then so the device can help start like, exchange some of the information in order to exchange for the service. All right. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, I think, uh, well, we are four minutes from the end of the meeting, so this is a good moment to stop. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, Gina, for the notes. And uh, Yeah, I'm quite sure I missed something in the notes. So if you came to the mic, please double check that I did not corrupt uh, yeah. whatever you said, right? I, I, but I definitely missed some of your comments. I marked it as a missed, so yeah, just so you check. Oh yeah, thank you very much. Everyone can 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 go and uh, contribute their uh, text to the to the notes. So please, uh, that's a very good point. If you were in the mic, uh, take a look at the notes and and make sure that uh, your comments were correctly captured. Uh, we'll we'll take those notes in a couple of days and make them into minutes. So you still have time to to look and make sure that the notes are fine. So thanks everyone. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you.